at all our recorded uh, events. So we are recording as of now. So if anyone doesn't want to be on recording, you can feel free to um, hide yourself behind the Tom Paper fractal image or <laughs> the image of your choice. Okay, well, it's 2.05. I say we kind of get going. Um, one, well, thank you for joining on a Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning, depending upon your time zone. Um, and we're especially pleased to welcome those of you from other MAP societies, California, and um, students of, of colleagues. So we're, we're happy to have you here. And um, it, it, as you know, I think we've, um, you know, we encourage you to join us if you, uh, if you haven't before, if you're new. Check out our website at the New York Map Society or our web or our web presence or Instagram. And um, if you find what we do interesting, we do events every month. And when we get together, we do field trips and we um, share some good joy and wine and food from time to time. So um, please, please join us if you're so inclined. And just a reminder, reminder to the current Map Society members, we are um, we've changed our program year from I think September to June to like January to December. So. Our, our, our year schedule and due schedules has shifted. So I'll send out a reminder for those of you have, who've not um, paid this year's dues yet, but um, I'm sure we'll figure that out soon. And let me turn it over to Andrew for a moment. He's got some housekeeping on upcoming meetings and then we'll introduce Judith. Well, hi there. Uh, I'm Andrew Capuchunas. I'm the secretary of the New York Map Society. And uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, next month, Saturday, April 17th, 2 p.m. Uh, using the same, the very same uh, link to Zoom, we're going to have Anna Polita Rule on her new book, Mapping Indigenous Land, uh, talking about uh, indigenous mapping in uh, Latin America. And uh, the following month, on Saturday, May 15th, we have uh, one of our members, Chet Van Duzer, is going to be talking on shipwrecks treasure and maps at the end of the 17th century. So uh, I hope that you'll be able to join us, uh, not only uh, for today, but that you're encouraged to uh, follow uh, what our uh, future uh, presentations are. It's an exciting year with an emphasis on women cartographers and indigenous mapping. Thank you. Great, well, we're pleased today to welcome Judith Tyner. Um, to speak to us. Judith is Professor Emerita at, from the Geography Department at California State University in Long Beach, where she taught map reading, cartography, remote sensing, and the history of cartography. Um, she's been looking, looking at women um, in the history of women in cartography since the 1990s, has written two books on this subject, Stitching the World on Embroidered Maps and Globes Made by Schoolgirls. And her current book, Women in American Cartography, she's in the early stages of a book on women and maps in World War II. We are especially pleased that this coincides with the Women's History Month. So join me in welcoming uh, Judith Tyner. I, I would ask that you mute yourselves if you, um, if you haven't um, during the presentation. Judith? Steve, you should be on slideshow. Thank you. OK. You got it? Looks good. Okay. At least on my end, it looks good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me uh, here in Women's History Month, uh, which was purely coincidental, as it turns out. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about the challenges of doing historical research on women's cartographies. Turns out it's not a piece of cake. When I first began researching women's cartography, it was a different world. Works on the history of cartography focused more on maps than chaps. The maps of different times and places were studied, uh, but very little about the people who made them, male or female. There were some pieces about major names, such as Mercator, of course, but very little about those who would be called the lesser men, who may have done the lion's share of the work. It was also assumed that all map makers were men. But in the late 1970s, things began to change. In 1977, Alice Hudson and Penny Barclay began looking into women's involvement in map making. And in 1978, Ronald Cooley wrote an article for the map collector titled Women in the Map World. And he provided a list of 62 names. He suggested that his list might inspire a monograph on the subject or the study of an individual. 
Walter Risto, also well known in history of cartography, took the suggestion. And in 1980, he wrote an article on Eliza Collins, America's first female map engraver. Mary McMichael Ritzland joined Alice Hudson on her search for women in cartography. And by, 19, by 2016, Alice had told me that their list had reached about a thousand names. And as these pioneers can attest, the search has not been easy. Alice noted in 1995, the women are there, but literally behind the veil of social and cultural constraints that continue to this day. Anonymous was often a woman, according to Virginia Woolf. In the world of early maps, unsigned colorists, names masked by initials, widows and heirs without their own names, all are lost to us unless unveiled by accident or design. Alice's words are true, not just for early women, but also women of the 20th century. Today, I'm gonna to look at some of the challenges I faced in finding women for women in American cartography. And I'm gonna look at some of the women who were serendipitous finds and how I found them. I'm not looking at these women today in chronological order, but rather by the ways that I found them. Christina Dando, who has written on women in the progressive era, uh, looked at women and noted, much of the research on women and cartography requires piecing together bits and pieces given little documentation survives capturing these women's contributions and details about their lives. Of course, the major problem is often no name on the map. Sometimes this is owing to the map having multiple contributors, such as in government agencies or commercial companies. I could sometimes find the names of women who worked for the company or agency or photographs of the women at work, but finding their specific contributions uh, of women or men it's quite difficult. And maps made by stock cartographers, graduate students, or other independent workers often lack names or even initials because they weren't permitted to put them on. The maps in the geographer Preston James' books were drawn by his wife, Eileen. There's no name or initials on her maps. For his book, All Possible Worlds, she was given credits in the acknowledgments along with the typist. And in later editions, she was listed on the copyright page. But in Preston's obituary in the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, it's noted, his wife, Eileen, constant and devoted companion and cartographer for much of his work, nothing else. I had not been able to find anything else about her other than that she was married to Preston James until actually this month. There's a 1958 booklet entitled Geography at Syracuse, where James <laughs> uh, in its directory, and then says, Mrs. James has become a full-time cartographer and names the Preston James books that she had illustrated. To this day, I'm trying to find out more about Eileen. What kind of training did she have? Where did she get it? Was she a former student, perhaps? A colleague of Mark Monmanier's at uh, Syracuse, David Robinson, just recently let me know that he had found that she was a graduate of the University of Michigan, that her maiden name was- Maybe Winter. your feetsies are so cold. Um, that her uh, dates were 1910 to 2001 and where she and Preston James were married, 1943 in Reno. Commonly, if anything, only initials were used. If the person became well-known, they could be identified in later years. A more common issue now is initials plus last name. This has become accepted in bibliographies and maps, but it creates problems for those of us who are trying to do research on women's academic and cartographic work. And I'm using here an example that affects me personally. If you look up J.A. Tyner on Google Scholar, you're going to see a range of articles. There are only two shown here, but cartography, history of cartography, the Philippines, population, Southeast Asia, quite a range. I'm not the only J.A. Tyner. And if I had known my son would become a geographer, I wouldn't have named him James Andrew. Related to this is the problem of married and maiden names. Again, I'll use a personal example. Judith Zink wrote a thesis on the history of cartography, of lunar cartography, excuse me. 
Judith Tyner wrote a dissertation on persuasive cartography. There's nothing to show that Judith Zink ever got a PhD and nothing shows that Judith Tyner wrote a thesis on cartography. Of course, they're both mine. Then there's divorce and marriage and the woman can wind up with three or more last names. And uh, Eileen James again, Preston James uh, was apparently her second husband and she was his second wife and there might be an interesting story there. Also, we have serendipity. Researching any aspect of women's history is more like detective work than the pursuit of knowledge via a methodical plan. Breakthroughs are frequently the result of random reading and acquisition of seemingly unconnected information rather than uninterrupted scholarly acquisition. I wish I could say that I found and identified the women by a logical method, but often my uh, methodology could be described as serendipity or dumb luck. Such was the case of three women of the early 20th century. A friend sent me an email with a reference to a woman who worked in Los Angeles in the early 20th century. I found that Glenn Creason, who is the librarian at the Los Angeles Public Library, had written about her. The demure appealing Laura Whitlock, as of 1910, was the official cartographer of Los Angeles. This map, her, her official transportation and city map, was copyrighted 1911, and it showed the Pacific Electric Railway System and one of many maps that she made. She didn't work for a company or agency, but was an independent map publisher, and at that time, apparently the only female map publisher in the United States. She also became noted for fighting for her copyright, she wasn't always as demure as she appeared, in a case that was beneficial for cartographers. I have an interest in the history and lore of Route 66. So when there was an exhibit in Los Angeles about the highway, of course I visited it. There was a small map tucked away down at the bottom of an exhibit titled The Main Street of America, which is one of the popular names for Route 66. It caught my eye, of course. It was white and blue, basically a blueprint. And in the lower right hand corner, which you really can't see uh, in, in this uh, slide, is, are the words drawn by Gertrude Brocht. The map was created in 1926 and is in a way Route 66's birth certificate. That led me to find out know, more about Gertrude. Gertrude joined the Oklahoma State Highway Department in 1923, and she remained there for 14 years. She was their official map maker for the state highway maps. And for much of that time, she was the only woman uh, drafter in the department. She had studied in high school, art, architectural and drafting, which was unusual at the time. And so she was quite well prepared for her work. Another serendipitous find who was also working for a government agency is Altia Armstrong. Um, the photograph of her may or may not be her. The, the references I have say uh, they think it's her. <laughs> so, um, she worked for the Texas General Land Office. She took drafting classes in high school and she was introduced to map drawing there, was so good that her teacher recommended her for a job at a blue company in the 1920s. She stayed there for a while and then in 1935, she went to the Texas GLO and remained there for 37 years where she compiled and drew county maps. This is just a, a sliver of one. She was noted for her unusual maps that combined precise drafting, but with artistic elements and fancy lettering. Each map supposedly took her 900 hours to draft. The Texas GLO uh, is rather proud of LTS maps and they have made reproductions of them available through their archives map store. And then we have multiple makers. Erwin Royce noted, the production of a map is a complex process. A map has to be surveyed, checked, drawn, engraved, printed, and published. And all of these functions are never done by one person. It's rather unfortunate that maps are often named after the person who did the least work on them, such as the publisher or the chief of the survey. This is especially true 
in more modern times with the increasing complexity of maps, the work of the individual can scarcely be, be distinguished and the name attached to a map or atlas serves more for the designation of map than to identify with production of the particular person. Royce wrote those words in 1936 when cartography, especially at government agencies and commercial firms, was beginning to see used more of a production line method. This was especially so with agencies during World War II. Individuals didn't make maps, groups or agencies did. For this reason, it can be especially difficult to find the women who worked for government agencies. But 1941, the uh, American Congress on Surveying and Mapping, which was the forerunner of Cartography and Ge Geographic Information Society, was founded. They published membership lists annually in the journal Surveying and Mapping. In 1942, at the beginning, there were four women. By 1946, yeah. the number of women had grown to 24, most of whom were employed by the government, and especially in this case, the Tennessee Valley Authority. None were specifically listed as the Office of Strategic Services, uh, the forerunner of the CIA, um, presumably because of secrecy rules. Even Arthur Robinson, who was the head of the OSS map division, didn't list that position. In 1950, the AAG had a session at one of their conferences uh, for those members who had an interest in cartography. Of the 242 who expressed interest, 40 were women. These lists were gold mines. And we must remember that prior to World War II, academic geographers, in fact, a few today, considered cartography a mere tool and perhaps a historical subject. At the beginning of World War II, the United States maps and mapping of the war areas was woefully inadequate. In fact, I have a quote by one gentleman, an army officer, who said, we weren't caught with our pants down, we had no pants. For some areas of the Pacific, the only maps available were French maps from the 19th century. The Army Map Service was established in 1941 and military map making training was established at colleges, especially women's colleges. The Office of Strategic Services was formed and a cartography section was created under the direction of Arthur Robinson. Women worked at these agencies in a variety of positions. They were map drafters, photo interpreters, photogrammetrists, and 3D model makers. And here the name of married names frequently arose for me when I was looking at women during World War II. I found names in newspaper articles and obituaries that were married, married names, excuse me. But the women probably worked under a maiden name. And that's the name that would be in the archives and records. An example is Marion Frieswick, who was the first woman recruited by Arthur Robinson for the OSS in 1942. She had been a student at Clark University. At the same time, Robinson recruited another Clark graduate student, Henry Frieswick. Hmm. Similar names. Marion Henry later married, but what was Marion's later name? Her maiden name, excuse me. Even in histories of the OSS, she is listed as Friesley. And ironically, while I was preparing for this presentation, I may have found it. I found the obituary of her sister and the name was Armstrong. There are several women from whom I have this problem. And if a married couple worked at the same agency and only the last name was used, it becomes doubly frustrating. This was of course the case with Marion and Henry but also Gertrude and Jack Wright and many others. Ava Madrill pointed out that while some women were well known in their day and their work mm -hmm. was easily traceable, others were serendipitous discoveries. And as with most discoveries, they were there all the time and usually known to others. Unearthing perhaps gives an appropriate sense of the archeological nature of the historiographical work and the thrill of finding even shards which tell us something new or enlightening. I muted. This was the case with Edna Eisen. At the beginning of World War II, the Army Map Service established military map making classes 
at 22 colleges to train people for the service. The majority of these were women. I learned that the instructor for the 3M class at Kent State University at Ohio was Edna Eisen. Edna arrived at Kent in 1936 when it was a normal school and her interests were in geographic education. However, Edna was especially interested in maps and map reading and wrote several articles on the subject and a book in 1937 on air photos. She was also a consultant <clears throat> of Cram Company, who was a maker of maps and globes, and she wrote their booklet on using globes. She also made the maps for her dissertation, which she completed in 1948. Edna had received her MA degree in the University of Chicago before the war, and when Edith Putnam Parker of Chicago was put in charge of the 3M program, she chose Edna as one of the instructors. Okay, and here we have Edna with one of her classes at Kent State um, showing a group of girls how to use, and those of us who've been in cartography for a while will recognize the ruling pins and the other tools in the, in the picture. 49 of her students went to the Army Math Service and 21 were still in government service at the end of the war, the highest percentage of any of the schools. Edna was quite well known in her time uh, she presented papers all over and art, wrote articles. But ironically, now, even most of the people of her former department, the geography department at Kent State, have never heard of her. B. Shaheen McPherson, who is always listed as B. McPherson, but uh, we were able to find their maiden name, was one of Edna's students. Um, Here's B in the 1940s sitting on the, the lawn of Kent State. B, after taking Edna's course, went to work for the Army Map Service as a drafter, but she was ultimately made a coordinator. And by the end of the war, she was assistant to the head of project draft, the project drafting department. While at the Army Map Service, she worked on maps for the D-Day invasion. In 2016, B was inducted into the NGA Hall of Fame as a representative of the military mapping maidens as they were called in the 40s. And thus at the age of 96, she became the face of the 3M girls. This year she will turn 100. Probably the woman cartographer best known now and most written about now was not well known 50 or 60 years ago and that is Marie Tharp. Marie received a geology degree during World War II when geology departments had been decimated by men being drafted and so the departments were open to women. She was hired by the Lamont Geological Observatory at Columbia University to draft maps from soundings that were taken from ships. In creating the maps, she discovered a rift valley in the mid-Atlantic range. She had confirmed plate tectonics and changed geology. By the way, before we switch slides, uh, we can go back. The sample drawing, the Library of Congress has her materials. And among them, uh, something that fascinated me, sketches where she was trying out the symbols that she was using. And even one, which I didn't include today, that shows her that shows where she had practiced writing Marie. Okay, but she was still not well known um, uh, at that time. And ironically, the famous portrait of the oceans map that was published in National Geographic wasn't drawn by her. Her map is on the left, but it was drawn by Heinrich Baran. In her her eighties. Tharp was given recognition by multiple organizations for her work, including, including being inducted posthumously into the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency Hall of Fame. And as I said, her papers are at the Library of Congress. The Society of Women Geographers has oral histories and books have been written about her, including some for children. So she went from unknown to probably the best known woman cartographer. And one area where women were often uh, working was in education. Emma Willard uh, said, maps may be said to be the written language of geography 
and nothing can be taught until the pupils understand the medium through which they are to learn. She is very uh, uh, forceful in promoting uh, cartography for female students. Okay. Um, but I digress. One reason that we, some women aren't discussed in the cartographic literature is the type of maps they make or made. There has been emphasis, especially for maps of the 19th and 20th centuries on scientific maps. So women who made school atlases or pictorial maps had been ignored until recently. Emma Willard, who was the founder of the Emma Willard Academy and who was mentioned in last month's presentation is one such example. Emma's emphasis was on education and she produced several school atlases and textbooks uh, and one of her students, a young woman who was about 15 at the time, Elizabeth Sherrill, drew many of the maps for Willard's Geography for Beginners. In the early 19th century, map drawing was a common subject for schoolgirls who produced elegant, very professional looking maps. Susan Shulton has said some work on this. Women didn't just make flat maps, they also made globes. These range from embroidered silk globes in the early 19th century, made by girls at West Town School, which was a Quaker school in Pennsylvania, to sophisticated conventional globes. Probably the most famous, at least at the time, was Ellen Eliza Fitz, who invented a type of globe mounting and got a patent for it in 1875. The globes were then produced commercially by Ginn and Company of Boston. Pictorial maps, Stephen Hornsby has written on these, and he says the dominance of scientific mapping in Western culture has meant that pictorial maps have been largely ignored. In the United States, these maps have been treated as ephemera, the flotsam and jetsam of an enormous sea of popular culture. In recent years though, Stephen Hornsby and others have exhibited more interest in pictorial maps. And though they're not featured in standard histories of cartography usually, there have been several books dealing with the subject. Pictorial maps became popular in the early 20th century and a number of women were well known at the time. Ruth Taylor White uh, uh, also known as Ruth Taylor created a children's atlas of the United States shown here called Our USA a gay geography. This is the frontispiece. Uh, it is highly cartoonish and contains very stereotypical, uh, often offensive representations that she was quite well known at the time. Louise Jefferson, uh, by contrast, an African-American woman who learned uh, some of her skills from her father, who was a calligrapher at the, um, the Mint, uh, or excuse me, the Treasury, um, also created pictorial maps, most notably the one here, African Americans of Negro lineage that celebrated the accomplishments of African Americans plus maps of Native Americans. Also maps of Africa, India, and China. Now these two women were not the only pictorial mappers. Uh, uh, I discussed quite a few more. Now, Sometimes I did my research with the help of friends. Some of these women were actually found by conventional research and um, by the help of others. Christina Dando has done work on women and maps in the progressive era, as I mentioned earlier. And she has an excellent book called Women and Cartography in the Progressive Era. Chris's work alerted me to several women I probably would never have found on my own. And I'll look at two of them today. The first of these is Emily Post. Yes, Emily Post of etiquette fame, which fork to use, correct behavior. Emily and her son Edwin and her cousin Alice Beadleson made a cross country motor trip in 1915 from New York to San Francisco. Route 66 wasn't around and there sure weren't interstates. Edwin did the driving. And Emily kept a journal that eventually was used for her book by Motor to the Golden Gate a year later. There are 27 maps in the book, all numbered. The maps are signed with the initials EP. And here we have an example 
of the uh, issue of initials only. Did Emily make the maps or did her son Edwin? Chris Dando and I both believe it was Emily. Emily notes in her work that her son did the driving and it would seem that she would have credited him if he had made the maps. He also went by the nickname Ned and he might have used NP had he made them. Uh, also, the maps are annotated with comments similar to those in Emily's journal. The maps aren't elegant. They're not professional looking, but they do the job. Her book was reissued uh, with an introduction by Jane Lancaster in 2004, and so it is available. And a fascinating woman I had never heard of before starting this project was Fanny Bullock Workman. Fanny was born in 1859 and she died in 1925. She was a suffragist, a travel writer, a cyclist, a mountain climber. She wrote of her travels and she was the second woman to be admitted to the Royal Geographical Society and was a member of the American Geographical Society. Uh, while I, when I first come in contact with her and seen a little bit about her, I was at the bookstore and I was looking at books on cycling because I cycle. Um, and there on the shelf, right in front of me was a book by, about, excuse me, about Fanny Bullock Workman and her adventures as a mountaineer. Of course I bought it. Um, but unlike the other women that I've talked about today, Fanny didn't draw maps. She organized and supervised mapping expeditions. She did make measurements for the maps, including elevation. But on her first trip to the Siachen Glacier, she made a plan to return the next summer and with a thoroughly organized caravan, including alpine guides and a topographer to visit the sources and have the glacier mapped in detail. She carried out her plan and was mapped. One of the more famous photographs of her is this one. She is on the Siachen Glacier in the Karakoram and the newspaper that she's holding, you can't read it probably through your laptops and phones, has the headline, Votes for Women. And then there were the planetary cartographers. Sometimes my researches have taken me out of this world. I won't read this whole one, but many decades ago, I wrote my thesis on lunar cartography. Dating myself, this was only three years after the backside of the moon had been photographed and eight years before the giant step in 1969 for mankind. I looked at early lunar maps but I was not aware that one of the primary lunar cartographers for the Aeronautical Chart and Information Center was a woman, Patricia Bridges, who began her career there in 1956. She made large scale shaded relief lunar maps, basically topographic maps of the moon. She used photo interpretation techniques, telescopic observations, and an airbrush in their making. She was so highly respected that she has an astronaut, excuse me, an asteroid, asteroid, here we go, uh, named for her. It's 4029 Bridges. It was named in her honor. So in summary, in this book, I began with basically the 19th century and ended at the end of the 20th century. I didn't include the wives, widows, and spinsters who were common in the earliest days, particularly in the, uh, the 18th century. Um, I, the, the women who worked with and inherited companies from their husbands and the spinsters who worked as colorists and book stitchers. Similar jobs existed in the 20th century. Women who folded and inserted maps into National Geographic magazine. There are photographs of this. Um, and also women who worked at the bindery for the former Thomas Brothers maps. I also didn't include those in GIS, although certain women are certainly involved in GIS. Uh, in terms of history, uh, it's still somewhat new. Esri, by the way, has a book called Women in GIS that they published in 2019, although many of the women didn't work with GIS as we think of it, but they worked in cartography and exploration. I also focused on American women because as I say in my introduction, life is short 
and to cover women in all of the countries would be a lifetime project. So today I have only looked at the tip of the iceberg. And indeed, even though there are more women listed in the work than I've covered here today, I'm continuing my work on cartographers, women cartographers, and I'm looking more deeply into the World War II period and the women who worked on the millions of maps distributed during that period. Okay. And I'd like to quote Fanny Bullock, when later a woman occupies her acknowledged position as an individual worker in all fields, as well as those of exploration, no such emphasis of her work will be needed. But that day has not fully arrived. And at present, it behooves women for the benefit of their sex to put what they do at least on record. And that's what I am attempting to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my la last page here, you can, you can maybe talk about the book. Um, um, you want to talk about the book, Judith, a bit? How to find it? Well, um, yes, I, I let my editor know that I was giving this talk. And so, of course, she had to ask if I could send flyers, but flyers are a little tricky on Zoom. Um, but um, she did send me, uh, send me one uh, that I've reproduced here um, with very fine print. Uh, but um, she also informed me that a paperback edition is coming out this summer. So uh, in case that's <laughs> of more interest. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, can, I can send the slide around to the people that have, that have logged into the meeting. I've got all the email. Oh, okay, all right. So I'll, I'll distribute it in email for me. my editor happy. I will. We will be, we're, here to, we're here to please. Let me see. I've got any. Um, stuff. Steve, may I ask a question from Judith? It's Ron sure. Gibbs. Sure. Uh, Judith, hi. That was a wonderful presentation. Oh, I'm thank looking, you. looking towards the future of graduate students in geography or the environment now. How does the gender breakdown uh, work out? What percent are women? Um, because I haven't been looking at this lately and I'm not, of course, teaching in that, uh, I can say from what I have read, it's improving, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are some, some groups of women in GIS that are uh, you know, working together and promoting the field. But uh, not yet. I, I have a question, Judith. Uh, uh, you, you said that you, uh, you know, your focus has been on what's happening in the United, what's happened in the United States. Right. You characterize perhaps the position of women in cartography, uh, U.S. versus other countries, or versus Europe, for instance. Um, I know there are others. Um, uh, Benden Hunard wrote his book, Map Worlds, and he attempted to cover women in all countries. Um, I have to hand it to him, that's a big piece to bite off. Um, and he shows more, but uh, I know in the past that, uh, for instance, uh, Thomas Brothers maps were, uh, exporting their jobs to India. And I'd heard that there were Indian women working. But I, I can't make any definitive statements there. I just haven't done enough looking at that area. Okay. I should do that. Judy, um, this is Trish Caldwell. Yes. I, I, yeah, thanks. It was a great presentation. Um, having been one of those well, women cartographers who was not allowed to sign anything at the CIA, um, but neither were the men. So uh, it was pretty interesting. The one fun thing that came out of this, just as an aside, and we can follow up on it later, is Henry Frieswick. Hank Frieswick was my chief at the CIA. Oh, um, will I be talking to you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the first few years I was there. And then, um, and it was, uh, and as an undergrad uh, at the University of Washington, I worked with John Sherman, who was the deputy to Arthur H. Robinson um, at, the, at um, OSS. And he was the one who told me, um, you might think about applying to the CIA. And the next day, an uh, application appeared in my mailbox. So, um, but, yeah, it's been an interesting haul. I was the, I ended up being um, president of the American Congress on Surveying and Mapping and was only the second person, second female who had done that. Yeah. Well, you were also one of the earlier uh, female PhDs in cartography, too. 
Oh, that's probably true too. <laughs> <laughs> so were you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But thank you, it was great. Really enjoyable yeah. and interesting. Yes, I, I want to talk to you because um, after the war, um, um, Marion worked for the, the CIA for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but then she quit and I knew that Henry had stayed, but uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know you knew him. A great state. guy, yeah, no, yeah. Oh, we could continue on later. Yes. Yeah, well, I, that, did, I was surprised, thank you. I didn't do as much on World War II in the book as I would have liked to, because I realized it was going to be the chapter that ate the book. There is so much there. Yeah. And so yeah. I thought, no, well, you know, put that yeah. one on the back burner. Yeah. <laughs> To be continued. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Any other questions? Let's see if anything, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, so no questions in the chat. Anyone questions, feel free to ask or um where I, I have a question, Judith. This is Tom Paper. Um yes. where are you, where are you going next uh, with with your work here? Uh on, on women? Yeah, well, I, whatever, whatever, whatever you're working on. I, I have two. One is, as I mentioned, um, looking at women in World War II. And I have learned more about World War II than uh, I ever tended to. And I am amazed because when I started getting into this, uh, most of what I had read was the OSS and the Army Map Service. What I had heard of Evelyn Pruitt, uh, the Office of Naval Research, and a couple others. And so I have been finding stuff on women at the Aeronautical Chart Information Service, the TVA, the USGS, you name it, if they made maps, they were hiring women during World War II because the guys were all getting drafted. Mm. So that's one place that I'm going. Another one uh, that's um, farther on the back burner, although I may do an article on it, has to do with maps on cloth. I've done one book about the embroidered maps, mm. but we start with Chinese silk maps and pertaining just to this, yes, upcoming stuff. Uh, the escape maps that were made in World War II and were printed on cloth. Mm -hmm. And bandanas used by Civil War soldiers. Mm. And turns out there's a lot of stuff out there about maps on cloth, including some uh, groups, uh, one that I looked at, um, the, Hima the Hmong peoples of Laos. The women made what were called story cloths that are mm -hmm essentially very stylized maps and some of them show what was going on in the Vietnam War. They show the Mekong River with people escaping in inner tubes. They show bombs coming out of airplanes, but it's in a map format. So that's that's the second one on the list. Judith, I, I've seen a number of like bomber jackets with the interior lining as a map. Are, were, yes. were those official issue or were those things that people kind of added? Uh, well, I'm not sure on specifically those, but I have just come across some things where that I'd heard of vaguely before where the guys would bring home their silk maps and their wives or girlfriends would have them made into dresses. And so I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> to find that the bomber wow. jacket lining is the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. It's a weird little corner of cartography. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for the um, for for a speaker for Judith? Well, seeing up, oh, Mark. Yeah. Uh, that was an interesting talk, Judith. Um, I'd heard it before, a good part of it, and uh, <laughs> it gets better uh, every time. Um. um you had a question on me about future work. Um, I'm wondering, uh, from the standpoint of identifying women cartographers, there is the obvious problem with initials. Yes. Um, have you had any difficulty just simply with um, personal names? Some of them do tend to be a bit androgynous. Yes, that that is a problem. And uh, you know, it always takes a little bit more digging because mm -hmm. there, are, there are a lot of names that could be either. And uh, so, yeah, that's, 
you know, identifying is, is one of the challenges, you know. <laughs> and, and in fact, I find that in, uh, I've gotten information from the various um, mapping organizations like NESAS and others, where I've got membership lists. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always interesting. And then when there are names from other cultures that I'm not familiar with, I don't know if it's a male name or a female name. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess the thing that's always tricky too is when you um, find a map um, in a publication and um, uh, it might be you know, something like an organizational publication. Um, yes. A soil survey or a geological re report or something like that. And uh, in some cases, the map author is identified, in other cases, not. Yeah. And you know, I'm just wondering about the possibility of putting out I, in some sort of a broad, I, I'm, sort of a broad announcement or, or a request for information to uh, yeah. circulate fairly widely. But, and sometimes I can't when it's a, a very old publication. And mm. so I, I'm resigned to the fact that I'm never going to find them all. But, yeah. uh, but just, just as an aside, because I have to mention his name, um, as, as some of you know, Norman Thrower, who recently passed away, was my advisor. Trish is also. Yeah. And one of my favorite maps is a map that, that dealing with who made it, was a map that Norman made uh, when he was a grad student. And it was published in a geography textbook. He knew he was not going to be permitted to put his name on the map. Oh, the map yes. was a, a uh, it was terrain representation with hashers. Uh -huh. And if I you look carefully on the map, some of those hashers spell out Norman, well, N J W. -G. Yeah, that's right. I've forgotten that. <laughs> that's my favorite map. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I have a question, and this may be treading into a little, little bit of dangerous territory, but I'll, I'll try anyways. Um, um, do you have any perspective or thoughts about, because men and women, um, I think, do see the world uh, differently? Uh oh, Tom, um, here we go. <laughs> I, I get asked that question frequently. Is there a woman's culture of map making? Um, well, well, actually, that wasn't the question. Go, oh, okay, okay. No, the question was, was, do you see differences in the way that men and women um, represent the world cartographically? In the sense of uh, the overall big picture of the world? Or yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. The symbols I, and things used. I, yeah, I don't know what it, what, what uh, it, but I just. I'm... Uh, I haven't so much in, because in one sense, uh, so many of the women I found worked for government agencies or companies, or uh, they were the staff cartographer, and they had to follow certain rules and regulations of how yeah. the map was to be drawn, uh, and not much uh, uh, individualism was allowed. Uh, the women pictorial maps. Um, or one place where you might see more, but the pictorial maps as a group tend to have a lot of similarities, and and so you know they they have their own culture as it were. So um, yeah, I've I've pondered this question, and I don't really have a good answer yet. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for your presentation. One, one thing in this talk that. I thought, thought it was brought to mind was Dava Silbel's book about the Har women at the Harvard Observatory. Yes, and yes. They, and it was the women who were central to the discovery of star classification, hmm. which has led to the whole theory of evolution of stars. And uh, your mention of Harp, uh, yes. 
seemed very similar. Oh, yes. If she was in a similarly supportive group. Uh, no, she was, well, she had Bruce Hazen, who was her partner at the observatory. And he's the one that went out on the ships and brought back the soundings. She wasn't allowed on the ships because she was a woman. And when she was sketching out the soundings, the story goes that she had, uh, she discovered the Rift Valley and she said to him, look at this. And he said, no, it can't be. That would indicate continental drift. And so uh, <laughs> she, she was kind of a, of a loner there, but, uh, but she won. But she was hired um, not because of her geology abilities, but because she could draft. And uh, you know she she had a lot of these things. There's some excellent books out about her and stories about her and uh, uh, what she faced. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, there, well, I, I was wondering whether there was a book. Uh, you say there are books out there about about her. Oh yes, yes, uh, yeah. It sounded like another wonderful story, like the story of. The Harvard women. Yes, yes, uh, it is, and um, I can't and think of the title of one of them off the top of my head. A comparatively recent one you know, in the last ten years, probably, um, mm -hmm. that is out, and it's 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 quite good. I don't want to jump up and go get the book. <laughs> so I, I, there's a chat from Mark asking you, Judith, if the name Eleanor Hanlon means anything to you. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, she apparently taught map making at Syracuse decades back as a part timer. And when no, I have not, Mark. We're going to have to talk. <laughs> um, it was it was Eleanor. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Eleanor Hanlon. Okay. Now, what years was that? Um, I was able to confirm that because I basically did a Google search. Um, uh -huh. And uh, so where were we like, before Google? Yeah, but um, um, it would have been certainly sometime before 1970. Hmm. And, um, but um, uh, there are some other mentions of her um, um, in various places. I'm yeah, you mentioned the, the name is vaguely familiar, but I don't have any information in no. my file about her. No. So, yeah, I, I, I think almost every day I find someone else, and I, I find, you know, I had to publish the book because the editors was getting a little feisty about it. But uh, mm. <laughs> I, I think I could probably uh, bring out a, a second edition with the. Uh, probably an equal number of names on them now. Because um, when I talk to people, you know, this sort of things come comes up. Have you heard of? Have you? And uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's beneficial for me to do these. I learn a lot. I mean, I suspect that there probably is sort of a level of sort of a flotsam and jetsam of academia. Um, people having temporary jobs here and there. Oh, yes. Well, Not so many... Making... But not really making any significant or lasting name for themselves yeah. Yeah. as a map author, yeah. but nonetheless being involved in cartography broadly yeah. defined. Well, the um, so many of the staff cartographers. I, I worked as a uh, as a research cart as a as a female. I didn't get to be a teaching assistant at UCLA. Um, they didn't specify it that way, but. <laughs> Um, but I was hired, they made a, a new position for me uh, mm -hmm. as a research assistant. They had a staff cartographer mm -hmm. and the staff cartographer, it turns out I had the better job. The staff cartographer was doing things like mending wall maps and patching things up. I was making maps for the faculty publications. Mm -hmm. So if they had a map that they wanted made, they would come to mm -hmm. me. 
and uh, I would do it. I could not put my initials or name on the map. Once in a while, one would let me do it. And sometimes I loved it. My instructions were, you do have a library card, don't you? I need a map of uh, some obscure thing. Uh, the, the maps of Barrow, Colorado Island, for instance, comes to mind. <laughs> and, um, but I did not have my name on any of those or my initials on any of those. Well, in situations like that, did you ever have the author of the textbook or the article put his or conceivably her name or initials on the artwork? No, I have not. Although it came close. Um, I took a graduate seminar from a professor who shall remain nameless. And uh, we, everyone in the seminar had a different subject that we were to work on. And uh, of course, I always illustrated mine with maps. And many years later, I stumbled across a book he had written and a familiar looking map in it and absolutely no credit. <laughs> He'd used my map, but didn't bother. I mean, it was a student who made a map. So it was, I can use that term paper kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be a copyright violation. I would think so, yes. <laughs> but at the time, unlike Laura Whitman, uh, Whitlock, I was uh, I was not that savvy, and I didn't fight for my copyright. No, I mean it even years later. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think it had expired by then. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And then I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I will do one other thing because it deals with women. I mentioned my thesis and my dissertation having two different names on them because when I wrote my thesis, I wasn't married, obviously. And when I came back five years later to start my PhD, uh, I had to enter the university with my legal name, which was my married name. And as it got close to time to finish up the dissertation, it struck me that they were going to have two different names. And so I asked, could I put my maiden name on this instead of my married name so that they have the same name? And I was told, no, because that is not your legal name. Mm. <laughs> I never changed mine. <laughs> yeah, I. I uh, Much simpler. <laughs> but yeah, looking back, I think I probably would have been smart. Yeah. Yeah. And I tried briefly to use it as the middle name, but uh, it, that didn't seem to go. So, yeah. <laughs> and now I've had this name longer than I had the maiden name. So what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I'm mean, looking through the field here. I'm not seeing any other hands raising. Well, look, I'm at, is there anything on the chat there? Nothing on the chat that I'm seeing, but um, most people are heading off. Look, I think uh, we've really enjoyed the conversation today and the, the follow up Q&A. So we appreciate your time and everyone's time. So Judith, um, thank you so much for your presentation and all you've done to kind of catalog, um, you know, history of women and cartography. So well, thank you thank very you. much. I enjoyed it and I learned a lot from it, too. So thank you. Yeah. And we'll try to make sure Alice Hudson can see a, a copy of the recording because I show I know yes. she's trying. Yes, please do. All right. We'll talk soon, Judy. All right. Bye now. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Everybody. Uh, yeah.